Today we are going to be assembling the Melotone Fuzz Kit and I'm going to be showing you how to do that uh, as simply as possible. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the tools that you're going to need. The first primary tool that you're going to be using is a soldering iron. You need a soldering iron that is between 15 and 30 watts. This might be the first guitar effects pedal that you've ever built, so you don't necessarily need to jump in and get the most expensive one. This is an inexpensive one that I purchased at a local hardware store. And you want to make sure that it has um, this sort of fine pointed pencil tip. Um, because we are doing fine electronics work, if you have a really large or blunt tip, it's going to be way too difficult to work with the precision that you need. Right here I just have a small damp sponge and this is what I'm going to be using uh, to clean my soldering iron tip as I work. Right here I have an adjustable spanner wrench. Um, I'm going to use this to um, install some of the hardware like the jacks and switches in the pedal enclosure. I'm going to need some wire cutters um, to cut component leads and strip wire. I also have right here just some needle nose pliers. Those are just generally useful for uh, bending component leads or moving things around where your fingers can't fit. Another tool that I'm going to want is a small jeweler's screwdriver um, with a small uh, flathead bit that I will use to put the knob on to the potentiometer. And then I also need just a regular Phillips head screwdriver I'm going to sit down and move the tools that I don't need out of the way. I am going to open up the kit. Inside of the pre -built Just have a little bit of uh, basic instructions and documentation right here. I'll set that aside and just some simple packing material. So let's see what's inside of the kit. We have two jacks. This is a stereo jack, which is used for the input, and a mono jack, which is used for the output. A three-pole double throw foot switch. A 100K audio taper potentiometer, which is going to be used for the volume control. This is a DC jack that will work with your typical guitar pedal power supply. Now we have a small bag of circuit boards and components for the circuit that we'll be making. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, I have a length of hookup wire right here which we'll be using when we put everything together on the pedal. A small knob. A 9 volt battery clip. Or some nice uh, cork feet that we will put on the bottom plate. When you're building a pedal, it, if you want to do any kind of decoration, it's way easier to do that uh, before you build anything. So if you want to put stickers on it or if you want to spray paint it or hand paint it or uh, design a label that you print out and adhere and then spray with clear coat, whatever you want to do, you want to do that first. I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm going to just put this Melotone sticker on here. I'm going to trim it with this hobby knife. That is how I've decided to uh, decorate my fuzz kit pedal. Um, so I'm going to set all these hardware components aside for a second. I have this uh, small bag which has various things in it, so let's pull these out and see what they are. The first thing you'll see is this uh, green circuit board right here, and so this is the PCB for making your fuzz circuit, and it is designed to make one of two different uh, fuzz circuits. The two that I selected when I designed this kit are very simple and uh, have long time been popular entry level designs uh, for the beginning DIYer. This is designed to be able to make either the Electra Distortion circuit or the Bayes Fuss circuit. They're both really simple and they share a really 
similar circuit topology, um, but using very different components. We can build this in one of two ways, and I've included components to do either. So let's see what kind of components we have. These two little black things right here, um, each have three legs. These are transistors. Uh, they're both NPN transistors. This one right here is a 2N3904 transistor, which is sort of a medium game transistor. And then this one right here is a 2N5088 transistor, which is a high gain transistor. So the 2N3904 is used for the electro distortion, and the 2N5088 is used for the base fuss circuit. Right here is an LED or a light emitting diode. This is what we will be using in our pedal as the bypass or effect on indicator. This LED needs to be used in conjunction with a current limiting resistor, which I have selected this resistor, which is a 22K resistor. And I know that it's a 22K or 22 kilo ohms resistor because of the color band code that is painted on it. It goes red, red, orange. And then the gold band is indicating the tolerance of the resistor. The uh, gold band means that it's a 5% tolerance. I have a bunch of other resistors right here. We have some different values. Right here is a 2.2 mega ohm resistor. This goes in the electro distortion circuit. This right here is a 47 kilo ohm resistor, which also goes in the electro distortion circuit. This right here is a 680 ohm resistor, and this goes in the electro distortion circuit. And this right here is a 100 kilo ohm resistor, and this goes in the base fuss circuit. I have two silicon diodes, and these are used for clipping um, to get that overdrive or fuzz effect in these various circuits. The electro distortion will use both of these, and in the base fuzz circuit, I only will use one. I have two uh, polyester film capacitors. This particular value is 0.1 microfarads or 100 nanofarads. They both go in the electro distortion circuit. The last uh, capacitor that I have right here is an electrolytic capacitor. Uh, this one is 10 microfarads in value. And this particular component is polarized. Um, so it has this band right here um, with some minus marks to let me know that this particular lead on the component is the negative lead which means that this opposite lead is the positive lead. This component will go in the base fuss circuit. And additionally, if I'm making the base fuss circuit, I will be using one of these 0.1 microfarad capacitors as well. A couple other things you notice in the little bag is there's this small piece of perf board and a small coil of solder for you to use, um, which should be sufficient to complete the project. The reason that I included uh, this small piece of perf board is I assume that most people are using this kit to build their very first pedal. You might not be totally comfortable soldering yet. Once you've decided which particular circuit you want to make, you can use your leftover components and this piece of perf board to practice soldering a little bit before you make your actual circuit. So that's why that's included in there. So, now that we know everything in our kit, we can begin. For this uh, pedal, I have decided that I do want to make the electro distortion, so I have all these components set aside for that right there. These components are only used for the base fuzz circuit, and so these are leftover. So I'm going to use these with this perf board to practice a little bit before I make my actual pedal circuit. When you use a soldering iron, it's important that you tin the tip. And what that means is that I'm just going to simply coat it with a little bit of solder and that way it will stay nice and clean and between every few components then I can clean it on my damp sponge 
and it will continue to work well for me as I solder components together. I will tin the tip in just a moment, but let me talk a little bit about inserting components into uh, solder pads on a circuit board, whether it's this perf board right here or an actual PCB. Uh, it's really simple. You can just bend component leads to 90 degree angles. You can insert them from the top side appropriately. From the bottom side, you can bend those leads out a little bit and that way it will stay nicely in place. I like to do the lowest profile components first. In this case, this resistor is the lowest profile component of these three. And that way, when I flip it over and lay it down to solder, it lays moderately flat. When I am soldering, what I typically do, after I've tinned the tip of my iron, I will take this soldering iron and I will hold the tip of it and I will make contact with both the solder pad on the circuit board as well as the component lead for about a second. And this will heat both of those surfaces up. Then I will take this solder and I will push it in to the pad and the component lead. I will push it in maybe like a millimeter or two and it will melt into place. And if all goes well, it should suck up together and I can remove the soldering iron and the solder itself and I will have just a small amount of solder on the solder pad. If it ends up being too cold, if I do not heat it up enough, I will get a cold joint. It will make good contact and may not conduct electricity appropriately, which means my circuit will not work. And if I put too much solder, I can potentially create a solder bridge where the solder will flow and jump not just from this pad, but to an adjoining pad, which can cause a short in the circuit. So I want to be as careful and precise as possible. And that is why I have included this extra perf board for you to practice with. I'm plugging in my soldering iron right now. And it's going to begin to heat up. As soon as it gets warm, I'm going to use my solder right here and I'm going to tin the tip first. Once I've tinned the tip, then I'll practice soldering a couple of these components to show you what that is like. And then I will move on and start working on my circuit board itself. I can hold my hand over it. I can feel heat rising so I can tell that this is warming up. If I just quickly dab it on my sponge, which is damp, I can hear it steam off a little bit so I can tell that it's getting warm. Here we go. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that very well, but now I have a nice clean uh, coating of solder on the tip and now I am ready to start soldering. I have this uh, practice component already set up. I'm going to go ahead and sometimes you need to rotate things around to find the most ideal angle for you to solder that particular component at. But what you can see is I'm about to touch my soldering tip to that component lead and soldering pad. Just for a second I'll just stick in just a little bit of solder, it will melt it in and then I can pull everything away. So I'm heating, soldering, pull away. A nice good joint, so I can move on to the next one. And that one looks good as well. Go ahead and wipe my soldering tip on my damp sponge. I can use my wire cutters and I will trim these components lead flush. Okay. I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to practice it a little bit more. I think the best thing to do when you're practicing soldering to practice your precision is put the components right next to each other and that way you can practice not getting a solder bridge. So I just stuck in this transistor. It's a little awkward because it's now making my circuit board tilt up a little bit so I'll just turn it as necessary to make it easier for me to get in there. Okay, 
So I have soldered all those successfully. That looks great. One more component right here. Let me show you what it looks like when you get a solder bridge. So if I'm not particularly careful, not precise, or maybe I put on too much solder, you can see right there, I just got a solder bridge. Okay? So those two pads connected together when they shouldn't have. And that's a problem because now the circuit is not going to work correctly. Of course, we don't want this to happen. They make tools to help you get rid of solder bridges, like a desoldering braid. But sometimes if I just reflow or reheat some of these pads, which I just did, it's difficult to see, but that bridge um, flowed apart and now it's not bridged anymore. Perhaps if I trim that a little bit, I'll reflow it again. And now it's not bridged anymore. You want to avoid bridges. They're not good. If you get a bridge, your circuit is not going to work. So you want to have as steady of a hand as possible. I know it's difficult. You'll get better with practice. Um, if you want a little more practice, um, after you've trimmed component leaves, you can just take some of these leftover component leaves that you've trimmed and you could stick them through this perf board right here and you can practice just with component leads as well. So there should be plenty of material for you to practice with. But now I'm feeling pretty comfortable. I've done this practice. Now I am ready to do the actual fuzz kit circuit. So I'm gonna get all my components and get to work. So I am ready to now assemble the PCB with the components for the fuzz kit. And because this PCB is designed for two different circuits, rather than having the component names or values labeled on the circuit board, it is instead labeled with just C2, C1, that's for capacitor two, capacitor one. These resistors right here, R1, R2, R3, for various resistors. Uh, you see the shape right here, that is for the transistor. And then these little two that are not labeled are for diodes. Depending on the circuit that you've selected to do, you need to consult the included documentation to understand which components go in which spaces on this circuit board. We're going to start with the lowest profile components. This is for the Electra distortion. So I'm starting with these diodes. These silicon diodes are a polarized component, so they have to go in a specific direction. A diode has an anode and a cathode. The cathode on the diode itself is normally marked with a black band or some kind of painted band right there, which hopefully you can see that. And on the circuit board, you'll see that where the diodes go, the cathode or that band is also marked. So I'm going to insert a diode. I'm going to bend the component leads at 90 degrees. Make sure that the cathode is oriented correctly according to the circuit board. I'm going to push it all the way down flush. I'll flip it over. I'll slightly bend the component leads out and lay it down and now solder those joints. I'll clip the component leads, flip it over, and now I can insert the other diode, making sure the cathode is oriented correctly. Flip it over, bend the component leads out slightly, and now I will solder. Now I'm going to move on to the next lowest profile components, which is the resistors, okay? And so I need to know which one is R1, which one is R2, and which one is R3. The 680 ohm resistor, which has a blue, gray, and brown band before the gold tolerance band, is R1. R2 is the 47 kilo ohm resistor, which has a yellow, purple, and orange band before the gold tolerance band. R3 
is the 2.2 mega ohm resistor, which has a red, red, green marking. So, we'll go ahead and start with that one. And if you're feeling really comfortable, or if you already have more experience, you might find that you want to actually insert several components at once and solder them all at the same time. So I have all my resistors in, I've bent the leads out a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and solder each of these. Okay, I think those solder joints look fine. So I'm going to go ahead and clip my component leads. I'm now going to install the capacitors. And these polyester film capacitors are not polarized, so they can go any direction. And I'm going to go ahead and just insert them both at the same time. I feel comfortable doing that. Sometimes, if the solder pads don't line up exactly with your component leads. It will take a little bit of bending to get it to sit approximately flush. You can see that those pads don't match exactly, that they're spreading the component leads a little wide. So I'll have to kind of wriggle it into place and solder those in. I just have one last component right here, which is this 2N3904 transistor. And it has three legs. There's a base, a collector, and an emitter. So this has to go in a specific orientation. You can probably see that it has this sort of half circle shape. And that means that it will correspond to that similar shape right here on the circuit board. So I'm going to align the flat side of the transistor. I'm spreading the legs a little bit so it'll fit better um, with the flat side on the marking on the circuit board. So I'll go ahead and insert that. And I'll push it down as far as I can. Then solder those joints. Clip that. So I have now completed the circuit of my pedal. Uh, the next thing that I can do to prepare it to go into the enclosure is I will solder it to this potentiometer. This is what we will use as our volume control. And conveniently, uh, we're using a potentiometer that has solder pins so that it can connect directly to this circuit board, which will just keep things nice and simple. Sometimes you will build a pedal where you connect your circuit to potentiometers using hookup wire instead. I'm gonna flip this potentiometer over, so I'm looking at the bottom right here, and it just slides right on, like so. I'll go ahead, and I'm going to solder it to each of those pins. These are larger solder pads, so it might take a little bit more solder than the other components. So that is neatly soldered on there now. Go ahead and clean my tip. And now I'm going to start working on the hardware components and the bypass circuitry of this pedal. I have my main enclosure. I have the bottom set aside. I don't need that right now. Here is my foot switch my DC jack, uh, these two instrument jacks. I have my nine volt battery clip, this hookup wire, and my LED and current limiting resistor, which again is that 22 kilo ohm resistor. 
So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to install the hardware on this enclosure. There are numerous washers uh, with this foot switch. So there is this toothed washer. So I'm going to make sure that's on the inside. I'll go ahead and just put my foot switch through. And then there is a white washer, white nylon washer, which will protect any finish or paint job that you've done. And then there's a nut. So I will go ahead and I'll just finger tighten that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use my wrench and I'm going to tighten that down. Um, so I've got my foot switch in there. I'm going to now put in the jack. So there are two jacks. This is a mono jack. So it has two connections. There's the sleeve, which is right here. And then right here is the tip. And that touches the tip of your guitar cable. And so there are corresponding solder lugs right there. This right here is a stereo jack, and it's not actually used for stereo sound, but rather it still has that tip and that sleeve, but it also has this other connection um, which touches the ring of your guitar cable, and that's used for power switching when you have a battery installed it means that it only connects battery power when the guitar cable is plugged in. We are going to install these jacks um, in this orientation. Turn it your direction. Of course we have the foot switch here. I'm going to put the stereo jack on this side. Of course it has both a washer and a nut, so I'll make sure to put that washer right there. And then I will finger tighten that nut, and I'm going to make sure that there are these three solder lugs right here. I want to make sure that they're nice and face up so that I can solder them easily. And then use my wrench to tighten down the nut. And I'll put in this mono jack on the other side. Tightening the nut from the outside. Okay, so I now have both of my jacks installed. The last hardware component that I want to install is this power plug. So I will take the nut off, and the nut actually goes on the inside of the enclosure. This jack inserts from the outside of the enclosure. And you can see that it has uh, three solder lugs right here. And so I'm going to orient it so that these two with their holes are face up. And then there's this one on the side right here. So I'll insert that right there like that. You have to be careful because these are plastic threads. It's not too tough, but you don't want to strip them. So I'm going to go ahead and finger tighten that down. Okay, so I've tightened it down with my fingers as much as possible, and now I'm going to use my wrench uh, to tighten it down the rest of the way. This is a little tricky because the only thing you have to hold onto it is from the outside in this little bit of plastic, which isn't like the easiest thing to grip. Um, so you'll have to just do your best. The way that I do it is I put my thumb right here and my index finger right here pressing onto that hole and just with as much grip strength as I can muster I hold that together and hopefully that holds this in place with the solder lugs in the orientation that I want while I use my wrench. And it's a little bit of tight quarters so you'll have to make uh, numerous sort of like quarter turns to be able to get it as tight as possible. So I have that in there and that looks great. So now I'm ready to solder up all these jacks and the foot switch so that I can have bypass switching for my fuzz or overdrive circuit. So I'm going to just uncoil this hookup wire. The first thing that I like to do when I am wiring up my effects pedal is that I like to set up the LED. And the LED, like any diode, has an anode and a cathode, but it doesn't have a painted band to denote which is which. And so the way you can tell is by the length of the component leads. The short component lead is the cathode, and the long component lead is the anode. We need to use a current limiting resistor in series with this LED. If we don't, then it will burn up as soon as we apply too much power to it. So I'm using this 22K resistor, 
and this is in combination with a bright white LED. And there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, it can connect to either component lead and work just the same, um, but I am going to connect it to the cathode right here. And so the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to just bend this out slightly. I'm also going to trim it uh, about in half, like that. I'm going to set this aside. This is going to be a useful piece later. I'm going to do similar to this current limiting resistor. I'm going to trim that about in half. And then I'm going to use my needle nose pliers, or you might be able to just use your fingers, but I'm going to bend this around in sort of a little hook like that. I'm going to do the same with the LED. Okay, so I have these two little hooks right here. So I have these two little hooks right here, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hook them together just like that, and then I'm going to use my pliers to crimp those hooks closed so it's nice and tight and stuck together. Those are crimped together tightly. And so now I'm going to take this arrangement and I am going to feed this component lead from the resistor through this top middle, or what I would call the top middle lug of the foot switch. So just like that. And as I do that, then I can wiggle things around and then push the LED to fit nicely in that hole right there. I have the LED resting in the hole right here. It's crimped together with the current limiting resistor right there. And then the current limiting resistor is connecting to the foot switch at this lug right here. So I'm going to solder it to the foot switch. And you'll find that when you're soldering to all these component lugs that it uses a little bit more solder than was required on the small solder pads on the circuit board. And then I'm also going to solder where it's crimped together. It's now all soldered together. I'm going to trim this component lead at the foot switch right here. But I'm going to leave this one for the moment. Uh, you can see that this is now kind of pretty firmly in place, that it's not going to fall out or anything. And that's how I do my LEDs these days, and I find that works pretty well. That's why I keep this LED hole pretty close to the foot switch. Now we need to connect the other end of the LED to what will be the positive power lug on the power jack. So I'm going to take some of my hookup wire. And what I like to do is I like to set the end of this wire where it needs to hook up. So I'm just holding it in place loosely. And I'll hold it in place with my finger right there. So it needs to go from there. And then I just kind of pull it out. And I know that I'm going to have my whole circuit board in this area right here. So I'm going to have to actually snake around. Maybe we'll snake around this way. So I'm going to have to go from there, around to here, and up here. Okay, so basically that's how I measure out. So I know I need that much of hookup bar, so I'm going to go ahead and trim that. That's how much I need. So you use your wire cutters uh, to strip the ends of this hookup wire. So it has sort of this like plastic insulation coating. And so what I do is I don't press hard that I just press sort of gently or with a small amount of pressure and I just press right there and then I twist or rotate this wire 90 degrees and I press again and then maybe go back and forth a couple times. What I'm doing is I am scoring the insulation so that way 
I can pull it off. So I'm just scoring the insulation, and then once I feel like it's scored, I again just put sort of like light pressure and hold it, and then I can pull. And so you can see that I just pulled off the insulation, but the actual wire on the inside remains. So this is stranded wire, and you can see that there's a bunch of smaller fine wires together. And the reason that we use this is that it means that the wire is really flexible, and if it gets bent back and forth a bunch of times, that even if one of these small wires break, there's still other wire inside to conduct electricity. If we used a solid core wire, and we bent this back and forth a bunch of times, if it happened to break on the inside, we would lose all conductivity, and there'd be no way to fix it except to completely replace the wire. So when I have this stranded wire, after I've stripped it, then I use my fingers, and I just twist it together, Okay, so that it sort of braids together, or sort of just forms like one single lead. I will strip the other end. You can see that this end I stripped to maybe about a quarter of an inch. And I did that because I know that I'm actually going to uh, crimp this around this lead of the LED. This other end is going to connect into that small hole right there on the power jack. So I'm going to actually maybe not strip as much insulation. So maybe just like an eighth of an inch. So you can see that I just stripped just a little bit. I'll go ahead and twist that. So this is the component lead that I need. I'm gonna go ahead and bend this into a little hook right here. Okay, so I have that little hook. And I'm going to just slide that down near the base, but not all the way to the bottom of that LED. So it's about an eighth of an inch away from this bare enclosure metal. We just don't want to short circuit anything. And I'm just using my needle nose pliers to crimp that closed on there. Now I will solder that in place. That's nice and connected. So I can go ahead and I will trim this lead of the LED. Now these LED leads are a bit thicker metal than all our other components and they're actually kind of useful for some other stuff that we're about to do. So I like to save them for a second. This is going to connect to the power jack right here. This is coming from the LED. But I'm actually going to save that till later because there's another thing that we also have to solder to that same lug. We have a lot of connections that we need to make. I am going to connect this lug of the foot switch to this lug of the foot switch. I could do that with some hookup wire, but I've really grown fond of using some of this leftover LED component lead. But the way I do it is I use my needle nose pliers and I bend it into sort of, I guess what I just describe as a staple. So kind of, if you imagine just trying to make a staple out of this, okay? So this is the shape that I've bent it into. I'm going to insert it so that it connects both of those lugs. So hopefully you can see how I have it inserted. I want to make sure that I don't press it so far in that it touches this lug because we have to connect something else to that so that would cause a short. So I have it resting in there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to solder both of those. trim what leftover component lead there is. And I have one more piece from that LED. And I'm going to use that to ultimately connect this lug to this lug. I'm going to insert it in place so that it spans across. It's going to sort of thread the needle between these, these two lugs right here. Okay? But for now I'm only going to solder it to that lug. Sometimes I find it helpful to use these needle nose pliers for such small things. Okay, so you can see I have it resting there, it's spanning across. I'm going to go ahead, I'll solder it right here. And the other one I'm going to leave open because I have to make another connection there later. So 
So I've soldered it right there. I'm gonna go ahead and trim the remaining lead that's sticking out. And it's stuck in place, so I can go ahead, even though I haven't soldered right there, I will also trim that. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook up the nine volt battery jack. And also I'm gonna hook up the power jack to the ring of the input jack. I'll first uncoil this. I'll kind of straighten out uh, these wires with my fingers. And to keep things organized inside of this enclosure so it looks nice, I'm going to actually kind of thread these under the input jack right here. So that way when the pedal is done, they'll be kind of tucked away. I have threaded it through, and I need to hook up both this red wire and this black wire. We will do the red wire first. The red wire is going to hook up to this lug right here. So I can thread it through any number of ways, but I think I'll go ahead and thread it up through the bottom. So I have it sticking right there, and I'll go ahead and solder that in place. Also trim the component lead. And now I need to hook up this black wire. And this black wire, if you can see it, is going to hook up on this side lug right here. And in addition to the black wire from the nine volt battery clip, I also need to connect this to the ring lug on the input jack. So I'm going to use some of my hookup wire and I'm going to measure out or stretch out how much I need. So I'm going to hold this in place, you know, about where I want it. And then I'm going to curve around and this needs to go to this lug right here. So I'm going to go uh, about like that. So I need that much. I'll strip the ends. I'm going to strip one end a little shorter, which is going to go into the DC jack. Strip one end a little bit longer, which is going to go to the ring lug on the input jack. Now I'm going to try and get both this black wire into that lug on the power jack, as well as this wire, which can be a little bit tricky because the opening in this lug is not especially large. Okay, but I managed to make it fit. I don't know if you can see that. Then make sure that they both get soldered in place together in the same lug. Trim any excess off. And I'm just trimming all this excess wire or component leads off just to prevent any possible shorts from things potentially touching together. Now I have this wire free and this is going to this lug right here. So I'll just go ahead and slide it in. And some people like to wrap that wire around the lug. I like to just rest it in place. And I'll apply an appropriate amount of solder. That is now connected. You can see it's kind of got a lot of wire floating loosely. So now I'm just going to press the wire down into place so that it's kind of tucked out of the way. That will provide a really clean look. Now that I've got the battery clip soldered up, I just need to solder these jacks to the foot switch. I'm going to first connect this lug to this lug on the foot switch. So, I will just kind of sort of loosely stick my hookup wire in there and hold it in place and then move it around in there. And okay, I think I need about that much, so this is how much I need, so I'll go ahead and Trim that, strip the ends. Okay, so I stripped one end short, which I'm going to use with the foot switch, and then stripped one end long, which I'll use with the jack. And I found it's easiest if I just simply stick it into the lug on the jack first. And I'll go ahead and solder it in place. And once it cools, then I can go ahead and I will stick it in the lug on the jack.
So now I can go ahead and I will press that wire down, kind of tuck it in. Now I'm going to connect this lug, which is the tip of the output jack, to this lug on the foot switch. Stick it in here, hold it in place, figure out how much I need, about that much. I'm going to strip one end longer. Twist the ends. I'll insert it into the lug on the foot switch and I'll solder that one first. I'll go ahead and insert it right there. Sometimes you might find that it's better to sort of tuck it down in place before you solder. Now I just want to connect the grounds. So this is the ground jack on this lug, this is the ground jack on this lug. And I'm going to connect that to the middle right there. So I'm going to make two wires, one to each. Okay, so that will come from that one. We've got this one as well. that one right there and this one also needs to connect to it so I will put that in also and I'm making sure that I get these inserted far enough that the insulation is going all the way to the lug and I'm just doing that so that it doesn't potentially short on this other piece that I put right there This one, and that lug, and that is the ring. Solder that in place. And then this one goes over here. And temporarily, I'm not soldering this one in place yet because there is a part of the circuit board that will need to connect to ground, so I will connect it to ground in that same lug. We've done all the bypass wiring that we need to do for our pedal. Um, we still have this wire right here, which is free floating from our LED, which we will hook up soon. We also have left this lug unsoldered because we have to make another connection there from the circuit board. Um, but we are ready to now put our circuit in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, of course, undo the nut and washer from this potentiometer right here. And you might notice that there's this little tab right here. We need to break that off. So you can use your wire cutters. You don't even have to cut, you just simply bend and that little tab will snap off. That's sort of a registration tab that some people like to use. Um, but otherwise, it won't allow this potentiometer to sit flush in the enclosure. We have the tab off, so we're going to go ahead and just, we're going to temporarily insert our circuit board in here. And the reason we're going to do that is we have to make four connections from the circuit board to various places in the bypass wiring. We have to make a connection for the input, the output, positive, and ground. I'm just temporarily going to put this in here so I can measure out how much hookup wire I need for each part. So I'm going to just set this in here and I'm going to orient it sideways like this. This is where it fits nicely. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put on this washer and this nut and I'm just going to finger tighten it. I'm not going to use the wrench at all because we're going to be taking this back out in a second. Okay, so I have that sitting in there and it's probably difficult to see but the input and ground pad connections are on this part of the circuit board and the output 
and the positive power connections are on this side of the circuit board. So let's measure those out. Let's do the output first. So the output is going to connect from the circuit board to this part of the foot switch, this lug right here. We are going to kind of snake around something like that. So this will be my output wire. Go ahead and strip both ends. Twist those together. So there's my output wire, I'll set that aside. And then we also need to do a 9 volt positive power to right there, so that will be a nice short one. So something... Something maybe like that, so nice little short one. Strip both ends. Twist those together. Set that aside. Now let's do ground. Ground will just go from about right there on the circuit board to this lug, so that can be a nice short one. So probably just something like that. Strip both of those. Set that aside right there. Then last one is we need to go from the input, which is right here, to this lug right here. So about like that. Okay, you can see we have a little bit of wire left over. those ends together. So we have the four wires that we need. So I'm going to go ahead, I'll take this out now. I'm going to undo the nut and washer. I'm going to pull out the circuit board. Set our enclosure off to the side for a second. And so we will now insert a couple of these leads that we made. Output right there. And ground. Carefully just set this down so they don't fall out. I'm going to go ahead and solder these in place. Okay, so I have those leads soldered in place. They're nice and secure. And now I'm going to do the ground, which goes right there and the input. Okay, so you can see that I've made all these wire connections to the circuit board, which is great. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put it back in my enclosure. We will put the washer and nut back on and tighten that down with my fingers. And then now I know that I can of course, fully tighten it down with the wrench. That looks great. So now I just need to make all these connections. So let's start first with this long one. You'll probably have to lift some of these other wires up and out of the way while you work with the one that you're working with. So I've got this output wire and I'm going to go ahead and snake this around. And this is going to go to this lug right here on the foot switch. And I'm going to trim that lead. Okay, now I'm going to do a uh, nine volt power. And this is going to go to that middle lug right there on the power jack with that free lead that we've been waiting to connect from the LED. It is a small hole, but we are going to try and get both of these into that lug. OK, 
Okay, it took a little bit of fiddling, but I have them both in that lug, and I am going to solder that in place. So those are both nicely connected, and the extra component lead isn't touching any other part, so there won't be any shorts. Okay, so we have just two leads left. This short one is going to ground, and so that is just going to connect to this really close and adjacent lug. So I'm going to thread it through, I think maybe from this back side. So that was simple enough, so that is now connected there along with that other wire, and now we can finally solder it in place. And lastly is our input, and input is going to go to right there. So that last lug right there. Alright, that's great. I'll just trim that little bit. This out of the way. That out of the way. Okay, we have finished all the soldering in our pedal, so now we can put the back side on. We can now put on our fancy cork feet. So it looks nice on the bottom, and we just have to put a knob on the top. So I turn the potentiometer all the way counterclockwise. This knob has a flat head set screw. I'm going to make sure that I use my small jeweler screwdriver to loosen that up. And since I turn this all the way counterclockwise, um, of course this is loose on here, but I'm going to try and set it to what I'm pretty sure is normally zero in its typical rotation. I'll hold it where it belongs and tighten down the set screw. And then I can check my work afterwards and if I need to I can make any adjustments. Okay. I think that looks pretty good. Our pedal is now done. Now we can go and if everything worked out, we can test it out and it's going to sound great. Let's see if our fuzz kit works. I have it plugged into a little test amplifier and I'm playing my Fender Jaguar. Here's the clean sound. Yeah. 